Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Token Post Interview. I am here joined by Mr. Joseph Fischella, the lead developer of Flow Blockchain and the co-founder of Alexandria. Welcome, sir. Thank you. So let's start with an introduction. Can you tell us about yourself? Uh, what is your background? Sure. Uh, I have a background in programming. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been programming since I was like 11 years old. Uh, 11? Yeah. Oh, actually, my mom worked for IBM for 10 years before I was born. All right. Uh, so she had all the equipment, like computers and stuff. She was a programmer too. Uh huh. Uh, and I just got into it at an early age. Uh, and I used to teach computer programming. Uh, in high school to kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school for computer programming. I graduated with a uh, software engineering degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been a developer my whole life. But then how'd you get into, how'd you move from programming to blockchain? Because it's, it's a different field, right? Yeah, yeah, great question. So my first job out of college, uh, I was working at a web dev company in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned about, you know, mining Bitcoin. Uh, I built some mining machines. I started mining oh. Bitcoin. Uh, and from there, actually, I found Flow because Flow has the same mining algorithm as Litecoin. Mm -hmm. So everyone that was mining Litecoin, uh, you know, was interested in mining other coins that were similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so myself, I looked on the forum, I kind of looked around, I was like, what else can I mine? Uh, and Flow was one of the coins, and I was like, wow, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found that someone made this coin that had this metadata field. And mm -hmm. it was before Bitcoin had metadata, it was before Ethereum existed. Mm -hmm. So no one else was putting, like, extra data on the blockchain. Everyone was thinking, like, how are we going to make new money? What are we gonna do with you know, Bitcoin and making like these transactional things? Like how do we make a future currency? Mm -hmm. uh, but no one was thinking about putting data and making like a database or decentralized store for metadata on the blockchain. Now let's get into our main topic of today's interview, Flow Blockchain. So sure. before we get on the specifics when it comes to uh, Flow Blockchain, can you tell us what Flow is? How is it different from the current out in the market cryptocurrencies? Definitely. So Flow maintains its focus on metadata. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea is to take metadata, put it on the blockchain, and make it decentralized. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we can create a searchable index for content. So Alexandria, first of all, we were uh, trying to focus on music and movies and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other projects that are looking at putting metadata into the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But the real purpose is to make sure that that metadata that points to content, that points to like you know when something was created or who it was created by, that should be indexed and publicly available to everybody. Uh, such that content that people create, information that they go into, uh, things that they put out into the world uh, can be found more easily. Uh, mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is to make sure that there's a network that's always online providing that data to everybody. So basically, metadata data is categorizing or sorting out this huge chunk of data, right? That's right. All right, right. So one of the main features of Flow is, like you mentioned, is metadata feature. So what is metadata and why do we need it on blockchain? Because it's mm -hmm. an existing concept you know, in the development field, right? Yeah. So. So metadata is important because it's the way that we find things on the internet, right? When you search mm -hmm. on Google, you search for a few search terms, uh, and then the index looks up, you know, what's related to this search term. Mm -hmm. um, with the blockchain, we can make sure that those things are never lost, mm -hmm. and they're never going to be owned by a single company. Mm -hmm. We have all these walled gardens like YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, everyone that owns content, and like when you type in a search term into each of those, you get wildly different results sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem there is that, you know, the content creators are kind of stuck into choosing between them, the users are stuck into choosing between them. If right. we had an open protocol where it was even between everybody, uh, then all the content would be available for everyone to uh, consume and there wouldn't be any like uh, way to take control over it and there wouldn't be any friction in getting the content that we want. But then if the project or the blockchain is open source, there has mm -hmm. to be like a standard when it comes to when people are trying to develop on top of it or upload content on top of it. Is there like a set standard when it comes to uploading content on Flow Blockchain? Yeah, so what we've done is we've created a standard called the Open Index Protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically all the software that we create on top of Flow uh, is in this, that set of standards. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does is it gives you a way to put information into the blockchain and read it out. Mm -hmm. uh, def finding a standard, oh, sorry, defining a standard that uh, makes sense for whatever content you're putting in it. So how, how would it be different with the OIP protocol, uh, of mm -hmm. Open Index Protocol, and without the Open Index Protocol? Right. So there are a few applications that actually use Open Index Protocol, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them don't. And the difference is, uh, without the Open Index Protocol, you just have data that's being put into the blockchain. Maybe you can use it to prove the history, like something was there at a certain time, right? Because mm -hmm. blocks all have timestamps. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could just put it there and use it like, hey, I'm just putting a thing here, Let's everyone, everyone can see it. Uh, but it's going to be hard to search, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just in a mess of other bytes of information. Uh, and there's no way to prove that you wrote it because, you know, it's just on the blockchain. It's in plain text. The open so, sorry. So specifically, if a, a person were to upload content, they would have to, like, write certain, like, title and, like, the author or the content, maybe? Yes. So in the Open Index Protocol, generally, you'll type, you know, your name, 
uh, and you'll put the title of whatever the content is. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the most significant thing is you'll put a digital signature of the proof that you put that content into the blockchain. So that's something that we're trying to standardize is that cryptographic proof that something was written by you uh, mm -hmm. and put on the chain, which if you don't use the open index protocol, you're left doing it yourself and then you have to tell other people, this is how I encoded it. Uh, and it becomes like a very big hassle. So if everyone's on the same standard, then we'll all have the same proof, we'll all have the same cryptography, we're all working with the same libraries. It just makes it much easier to search and verify that things are there. But then when it comes to uh, uploading content or content itself, there's a lot of fields out there. Per se, like if I were to upload my article on it, news article on it, or a hospital will, is trying to upload their medical records on it, it's gonna be done on a different standard, right? So how does OIP take the different, like these differences when, uh, on the different fields that are out there? How does, it take a, in, how does it take the differences into account? So you can create your own dynamic record type, All right. which means you can create your own fields, you can create your own structure, or you can use one that already exists. Uh -huh. So it's up to you as a content creator to either go with something that's already standardized uh, on our standard or make your own new type. Mm -hmm. uh, and either way, like you'll be able to search through it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if people are used to searching one way or another or they're used to consuming the content one way or another, it might be better to go with an existing article standard. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think it's not good enough for you, you can create your own and then other people might use it on the protocol. Mm -hmm. But then if, if they can just create their own, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be uh, a bit too broad? to be considered as a standard? As a user, that's your choice, right? Oh. <laughs> so the standard is the way that the data gets signed mostly, right? Oh, it's okay. the proof of, you know, you wrote this, right? And you have mm -hmm. your own address, sort of like a Bitcoin address where you have a public mm -hmm. and private key. Uh, and the standard says like, you know, these are the people that are writing these things and you can look up what someone wrote. So really at the, at the base protocol level, the only thing that, you're really, that you really have to do is sign uh, the transaction with your key. Oh, so it's the signature that counts, not the format of the content. That's right. Now let's switch gears to Alexandra, where you are the co-founder of the project. Now, yeah. Alexandra is a project striving to create a decentralized library. Now, uh, in your own words, how would you define Alexandria? So I would define Alexandria as like an iTunes for everything. Oh, right? okay. You have, a, and iTunes is like a library. You have a library of songs, you have a library of videos, music, mm -hmm. movies, even educational content is on iTunes. So I would say Alexandria is like the iTunes for the entire world, for everything that's out there. Uh, you can put any content on it. Uh, it's open for anyone to participate in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the protocol of OIP gives content creators uh, the ability to monetize their work mm -hmm. uh, in a way that you know, an iTunes or YouTube wouldn't be able to do. Then how does OIP represent an improved improvement to the existing standards are currently out in the market? So no one gets any cut of your profit in OIP other than people that are providing security to the network. Right, mm -hmm. So the people that are mining uh, Flow, they're providing security to the whole Flow network, which means that the information is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people that are providing the retail front-end website, uh, which we call a platform, mm -hmm. uh, they're getting some cut uh, of the transaction if you sell some songs or you know, sell whatever content mm -hmm. on Alexandria. And payment will be made via the Flow and Coin? So we're actually, <laughs> this is a little bit technical, but we <laughs> implement a BIP32 wallet. Uh, All which right. is, uh, <laughs> Almost every coin that's derived from Bitcoin, including Litecoin, Ravencoin, Flow, mm -hmm. uh, they're able to be put into this Bit32 wallet. Uh, we have a wallet that supports almost every coin. For now, we've just started with Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Flow because they're the most popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually we're gonna add more. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can make a payment in whichever currency you would like that's supported by our wallet. And we're thinking of adding some other ones like EOS and ETH that are not uh, supported by Bit32. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, like that was just an easy win. We're able to implement that. Now, blockchains are said to be not ideal for uh, file storage because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of heavy, right? The contents are kind of heavy when it comes to like music, music videos or 4K videos, right? So uh, as a decentralized application for publishing creative works, uh, how does Alex Alexandra handle with storing works? Does the entire content go up on blockchain or is it just like stamped and then the stamp goes on blockchain? How does it work? So what happens is in the open index protocol, you're able to provide whichever uh, storage provider you would like. Mm -hmm. So for now, we just support IPFS, which is a general cloud storage, sort of decentralized uh, BitTorrent type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, we're going to support any, any protocol that you would want. You can even use like a local file storage, FTP or something like that. Uh, BitTorrent actually, which is something that we originally tried to implement but wasn't really ready at the time. Mm -hmm. Now we think a few years later, especially because they're taking a step into blockchain, mm -hmm. that we might be able to implement BitTorrent and IPFS as our first two. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to answer the question more fully, Nothing is nothing that's content based, like the payload of the information, like the video file or like the text of a book, 
Nothing like that is going to be stored in the blockchain. That's mm -hmm. all in this uh, universal resource identifier, which is usually like an IPFS hash or something like that. But then what about the right to be forgotten? Because one of the uh, advantages of using blockchain is that it's immutable, right? Yes. But then if I were to upload my content on the blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, would I have my right to be forgotten on blockchain? So with blockchain and networks that are based on Bitcoin especially, uh, you cannot delete things that are in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But what we would do as a company and as protocol providers is make it easy for people to delete uh, references. So right. for example, if you're on the Alexandria front end, Alexandria.io, mm -hmm. uh, and you're browsing some music and movies and some, someone uploaded something that shouldn't be there, uh, or you know, like you said, someone uploaded something that they want to eventually later on have forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, then they would be able to uh, request that uh, we have uh, some sort of blacklist system mm -hmm. um, and they would uh, add their content to that and it wouldn't show up on any of the front ends. Mm -hmm. So technically it's still in the blockchain. If it's on IPFS, I don't know, right? <laughs> right. Uh, that's up to the IPFS providers or whoever is supposed to be host hosting mm -hmm. that data. Um, but you can request and there is like a blacklist and a whitelist system where you can remove content from showing up on the front end. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, you would have to go into the blockchain and find all the bits of data and like kind of reconstruct it and reverse engineer it. It right. is there, mm -hmm. uh, but it depends on whether or not, you know, someone's going to take that time to do that work. All right, but then uh, when, when it comes to censorship issues, because you know, yeah. sensitive contents could come up on the blockchain, on the Alexander platform. So like when it comes to censorship issues, you guys do have the uh, power to block out certain users or accounts contents. So every front end that uh, integrates our protocol will have the power to do whatever they want, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, you're connecting, a user is connecting to their website to get right. that information. Mm -hmm. So if they implement our protocol and censor everybody except for a few people they like, mm -hmm. or let everyone on except for a few people they don't like, they're able to do that. But the hope is that people use our software within you know, the correct laws within their jurisdiction, mm -hmm. uh, but also within the correct philosophy, which is let everyone speak about what they want to. Uh, and if no one does that, then that's a real shame. But mm -hmm. we're giving them the opportunity to make it open system. Mm -hmm. So Alexandra, it, it's a solid platform, but it, it's limited on contents, right? So other than Alexandra, what, what are the third-party dApps currently on the market uh, that encompasses or embraces Flow Blockchain? So right now, the biggest uh, full-time, um, <clears throat> sorry, the biggest production application we have is the Caltech Electron Tomography Database. And what that uh, is, <laughs> basically, uh, you have a, a microscope that's very expensive, All right. uh, and it looks at cells very closely. All right. Uh, and we're able to see how the cells are constructed mm -hmm. uh, and see in almost 3D what they look like on a petri dish. All right. Uh, if you think of like a movie and like a cell, like you know, being uh, investigated <laughs> by the most expensive microscope, you think of like a 3D like animated thing. Right, but right, in actuality, right. right now in 2019, uh, it's like a 2D image of like a black and white cell mm -hmm. uh, and you like <laughs> click through and it like moves around a little bit. Uh -huh. um, but it is actually very cool. Uh, and the reason that we put this on OIP uh, is because we wanted to have open access to scientific data. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when people are working on a project in academia, they'll you know get funding and they'll have um, some research group and some group of people that want to own the data right. uh, and own the access to the data especially. But the guys at Caltech, especially Davi, who's heading the project, uh, he wanted the access to the he wanted access to that data to be open, so mm -hmm. that anyone can take a look at the eleven thousand tomograms that they have. And tomograms are just like an image file of mm -hmm. the microscope data, um, and he wanted everyone to be able to look at that and take it and maybe do their own research on it because you know who knows someone could cure a disease or someone could figure out how to fight this infection based on his work. But then, since it's based on blockchain, the mm -hmm. authenticity of the research that you know, someone does, it's going to be kept, right? That's also right. Mm -hmm. So all the, all the uh, tomograms that are on the electron tomography database, uh, they're signed by Caltech's key. And what that means is anyone can verify that Caltech actually put those images onto the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So it's actually for two purposes, exactly right. Uh, we have open collaboration for scientific data, mm -hmm. and we have, it's provable that Caltech actually put that out there. And on the website, Caltech, uh, etgb.caltech.edu, you can find out more about how that process works. Mm -hmm. So you are a developer yourself. So yeah. uh, now we're here in Korea. Now, how would you say that the, the development like environment, ambience is here when it comes to blockchain in Korea? It's great. So mm -hmm. I've been meeting with a lot of companies uh, and they're telling me that you know, enterprise adoption is really big here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Samsung has the new phone coming out that right. has a blockchain wallet. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Uh, on the regulatory side, you know, even Vitalik at Deconomy a few days ago was, was saying, you know, we should be more open or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's always a tough thing to do, right? In New York, it was especially difficult because they actually introduced new legislation called the Bit License, mm -hmm. which made it much harder for companies to operate with cryptocurrency in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I would actually resonate with Vitalik's thinking here, which is it's much better to have an uh, open ecosystem uh, and let a thousand flowers bloom mm -hmm. than to be restrictive. Uh, but on the tech side, it's great. Any uh, prominent uh, projects or uh, career-oriented uh, team that you ran into? Uh, I actually really like the guys at Ergo. Oh, okay. Uh, I haven't met with them yet. Uh, I just saw their presentation uh, at the economy, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like they're having a lot of adoption. It's tough to get adoption right now. Mm -hmm. uh, people are struggling to get users. They're struggling uh, to you know get blockchain out there into the mainstream because it's so hard to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like they have uh, a strong tech team and a strong background in open source, especially Red Hat, New, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the little question we have today, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. Joseph Fischella, the lead developer of Flow Blockchain and the co-founder of Alexandria. Thank you for watching.